everyone to this session on challenges in peer review uh, in promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, my name is Moin Syed, University of Minnesota, um, and we have two other panelists here who will introduce themselves as well. Um, and we will just um, talk about some issues with peer review and journal editing and submitting to journals um, for about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. Uh, and then we look forward to the Q&A um, that occurs the day of the conference. So um, without further ado, we'll do introductions. So I'm already talking. I can just keep going. As mm -hmm. I said, I'm Moin Syed. That's like Moin like coin, Syed like psychology educator, Moin Syed. <laughs> I'm from the Department of Psychology at the University of Minnesota uh, in the US. <clears throat> um, I have a pretty good amount of experience with um, publishing and editing. I've been an editor of two journals, um, previously uh, the journal Emerging Adulthood, um, and currently the journal Infant and Child Development. Um, and so uh, I've been quite involved on that end of things. I've also worked on several special issues of journals um, and also been a pretty strong advocate of reforming our current system of publishing in a variety of ways, um, particularly around um, diversity of authors um, and editors and reviewers, and also in terms of open science and thinking about how to change our publishing model to make sure that we have more reliable and um, transparent research, particularly in terms of registered reports, which perhaps will come up in our discussion here today. But um, yeah, so before I keep rambling forever, I'll pass it to Lucia. Wonderful. Thank you, Moin. So I'm Lucia Magis Weinberg. I'm assistant professor in the University of Washington in Seattle in the United States. I am originally from Mexico, and this has really informed my interest in working with Latin American populations. I study mostly in Peru and in Mexico, the relationship of social media with adolescent well-being and mental health. And I'm happy to talk uh, about my perspective sort of being in the US, in a US institution, trying to publish work that has been done outside the US and some of the challenges that we've had. Um, I am, uh, as the other panelists here, a big proponent of open, open science that makes our our work reproducible and, and more meaningful, but very much aware of the barriers that that can put on, on people outside the US and outside the resources that might be available in some countries. Um, yeah, and very much uh, committed to diversity in the populations we study, in the teams that we form and the discussions that we're having. So delighted to be talking to you all. Hello everyone, my name is Aranda Jayavikrama. Uh, and I'm a, psycho I'm a psychology professor at Wake Forest University, which is in North Carolina in the US. Uh, I have lived in the US for 21 years now. I grew up in Sri Lanka. Um, and my I'm a personal psychologist. In terms of my research, I wear multiple hats. So I do basic research in personal psychology. Uh, I have an interest in uh, how people respond in adaptive ways find the experience of adversity and trauma. And I examine the research question in different communities around the world, including um, Sri Lanka, my home country. Um, I've also had a long term research program with various colleagues in Sri Lanka looking both at post traumatic growth and, growth and resilience, as well as um, cultural variations in symptoms of psychopathology. And I have worked extensively with collaborators at universities and nonprofits non in Sri Lanka, in Rwanda and other countries. Um, I have some experience, uh, like, uh, maybe not as much experience as Moin, but I've, uh, I'm an associate editor for two journals, uh, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology and Applied Psychology, Health and Wellbeing. I've also had the opportunity to, to guest edit a number of special issues. Um, I am a pro pro proponent of open science. I am a proponent of bringing people from around the world into our scientific community. And with that goal in mind, I am I, interested in thinking about what a truly open science would mean uh, in terms of bringing everyone in as equal, equal participants of our scientific community. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, so with introductions behind us, we'll just jump right into some questions. Uh, the organizers of the conference provided us with some suggested questions. And so we'll start with those. Um, and then we'll just kind of see where our discussion goes. It might be a wild time. Um, so the first one um, is, where do you publish or disseminate your research? 
Um, do you have a preference for open access journals? Um, and what influences your choices? So talk a little bit about kind of your strategy for what journals you choose, why you choose them, what the influences are, etc. So Lucia, you want to start with this one? Uh, certainly. Um, I publish mostly in journals about adolescents, uh, given the population that I study. Um, I would typically prefer, and I, and I would choose an open science journal, but I am starting my own lab. I still don't have like the grants, so I am currently still sensitive to the cost of publishing open, open access journals. Uh, what I personally like to do is to perhaps not choose to publish open access, but always uh, include our preprints and disseminate our preprints once the article gets accepted as a way of perhaps cutting costs uh, when possible. But yes, if given the option, I I think open access, making our, our articles as widely available as possible is important. Um, not peer review per se, but one thing that I realized was there's a lot of outreach and science communication in English mostly. And for five, six years now, I have worked with other colleagues um, who are all originally Mexican and we speak Spanish in sort of writing summaries of the papers we publish in Spanish for uh, a blog website we created called Neuromexico uh, that has wide reach. So we realized that the barriers to accessing the journals um, are huge. So finding ways of uh, perhaps not translating the whole article, but like writing short summaries as a way of, of amplifying the findings. Can you, I'm going to ask you follow-up questions just because yeah. I'm interested. <laughs> um, I'm self-appointed in charge here, by the way, everyone who's <laughs> watching. So I'm, <clears throat> now I'm in charge. Um, I'm actually curious in terms of, you said you primarily publish in adolescence or developmental journals. How do you, how do you decide within that realm, putting open access aside, kind of what, what goes into your decision-making process about what journals to target and why? Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting question that I'm learning to navigate. Uh, it's also some part of the hidden curriculum. I think sometimes we're not explicitly taught on how to choose journals. I think I read uh, other types of articles. I try to find like similar approaches. What I do is mostly quantitative work. So our uh, journals that, that are that welcome those, that type of research. Um, balancing whether we want to target an international journal that explicitly welcomes international collaborations. Um, sometimes we need to yeah, uh, mar market our work as international. Sometimes I try to go away from that for other challenges that we can talk about later. So yes, finding journals that are open to international populations has been uh, part of the learning curve. Uh, I find that some journals are much more open to it. Um, for example, the Journal of Adolescent Health, we submitted there recently and in one of, they're more between public health, uh, psychology, and in, I mean, as part of their submission, they just explicitly list all the countries in the world and they tell you, where did you collect your data? So uh, that for me was a super strong signal that they welcome international work, which isn't the case in other journals. Miranda, go for it. All right, so um, as I mentioned in my introduction, right, so I do wear different hats as a as a psycho psychological researcher and that does inform uh where i you know what i decide to send my research right so part of my identity is a personal psychologist so i so when it comes to some of my work on um personality theory or some of my research and to more basic personality questions i tend to target more standard personality journals and those would include journal of personality journal of research in personality uh, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, European Journal of Personality. Right? Those would be the, some of the major like uh, psychology journals that would be favorable to personality research. Um, but I also have research that I do looking at um, mental health and resilience in response to ethnopolitical warfare. So this is the research I've done in Rwanda and Sri Lanka. And I've tried intentionally to pick journals that um, would enable my research 
on those questions to be as widely accessible as possible. Um, so, you know, in the last couple of years, I've intentionally picked open access journals uh, in order to publish that work with the hope that even if, you know, those journals aren't as successful in traditional metrics, from the perspective of researchers in those countries or from that part of the world being able to access that research and maybe benefit from it, you know, um, what are called, they would have the opportunity to access it, right? And there are, you know, especially in the wake of this movement towards open science, there are newer journals that have come up that I think are a good fit for this type of research. Just to provide one example, um, Social Science and Medicine recently op uh, started an open access journal called Social Science and Medicine Mental Health. Um, and I think one of the main goals of that journal is to promote researchers doing international mental health research. Uh, and, you know, and what's nice about that journal is they also provide a sliding scale. So someone like me from Wake Forest, I can afford to pay the fee. So I pay the fee. Someone who's the main author who's from a, a country in the global south, it's free, right? So I, I, I really enjoy that model. Uh, we've already, you know, I've, I've been uh, lucky to have one paper published there. My plan is, set, is to send more work there. But I think that type of model is one that we should try and promote. Um, so I guess with regards to the question, do I have a preference for open access journals? I think I do, so as I mentioned earlier, I, with, dependent on the type of research, I would probably prioritize that. Um, I think with there's an interesting question of, uh, and this is something we could talk about, right? Which, what are the costs and benefits of paying open access fees depending on the journal that you're submitting to, right? Because there was one case a few months ago, and I have to remember the journal, where I considered making open access, but they were asking for something like $7,000. Um, and that struck me as, well, that sounds like, you know, uh, you know that, that sounds a little extreme, right? Um, so it's interesting to think about like where my preference for open access stands depending on the research I'm doing and the in the target audience that I have, right? Um, and maybe that's something we'll talk about later in terms of the barriers for, I mean, because I think one practical outcome of this is that for people who don't have the resources that those of us who are in North American universities have, being able, like there are significant barriers to publishing open access journals, especially for journals that don't have this sort of sliding scale uh, system that social science and medicine has. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, this question to me is really something I wrestle with a lot because um, most of my time, question again to remind everyone, where do you publish your research? Do you prioritize mm -hmm. open access? A lot of my time is spent um, really trying to change the current system that we have. And, um, you know, the, the over-reliance on for-profit journals, of which I edit one, you know, so how I'm sort of I'm trying to change that system while also working within that system, right? So that classic problem that comes up all the time, how do you change the system while being part of the system? Um, and so I just try to kind of slowly chip away, you know, as I'm able to. So like being an editor for a for-profit journal, I'm trying to change that journal to make it more open science friendly and slowly get to where it should be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it, generally speaking, in terms of my own approach of publishing work, you know, at this point, in my career where I've been promoted as much as I'm going to be promoted. So I don't have to worry about that. Right. It's an incredibly privileged position right, to be in. And so I can say, well, if I'm the lead on something, I'm going to publish it in an open access journal, mm -hmm. unless there's some reason I can't, if it's for a special issue or something like that. Um, but even in terms of resources, so it's interesting, you know, I'm at University of Minnesota, incredibly well-resourced school. I don't have very good resources for publishing in open access journals because either I have to have a grant specifically to do that, or I'd have to get institutional funds, but our institutional, our library doesn't want to support that anymore, providing funds, because they want to put pressure on publishers mm -hmm. to not require it. And so now I can't get funds from my, my library either to publish open access. So it's actually a little bit more difficult to do, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I'm talking with my students, if I have a student co-author or other collaborators, you know, I won't push my open access agenda on them, but I will talk about it. You know, I'll say, well, there are different options. Right. And so we could go, we could send this to an open access journal and here's the pro and con pros and cons of that. Or we could send it to a traditional uh, subscription for profit journal and mm -hmm. here are the pros and cons of that. 
And, you know, I kind of lay out the, the, the whole situation and say, you know, I'll support you in whatever you want to do. I just don't want there to be this kind of unquestioned allegiance to certain journals. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, we, we tend to prioritize and valorize certain journals in the field. And the only reason we do that is because we do that. They really aren't reputations that are earned. We know this from every analysis that's been done looking at, for example, journal impact factor and what, how it relates to quality. It either doesn't correlate with any indicator of quality or correlates negatively with any indicator of quality. All journal impact factor really means, well, that's a whole other discussion. It means a few things, but, you know, a lot of it just means what we have decided is a good journal. So we have sort of socially constructed that this is an important place to publish. And so I kind of feel like we can socially un construct that right and mm-hmm. change that and it's it takes a long time to do it but i try to have those discussions with people uh lucia mentioned mm-hmm. preprint oh go ahead yeah just a quick follow-up uh both of you have like are much more senior than me have you seen an impact on like the trajectories of papers that get published open access versus not are, are they really more popular are they like among your most cited work does it really matter well, I think it's related to what I was just about to say, which is that you mentioned, which is about posting a preprint version of your paper. So I pretty much post a preprint or a postprint, you know, a version of the article was accepted, but the non-formatted version, I'll put a version of that on SciArchive, the preprint server. Almost any journal in psychology allows you to do this. So it's permissible and you can look it up and there's tools for this, um, Sherpa Romeo, and there's other ways of, of finding it out. So for the last, I don't know, seven, eight years, pretty much any paper that I ever publish, I'll also put as a preprint. So everything is open access one way or another. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is free. And um, certainly, you know, I don't have a way to compare it to what, you know, again, what would the counterfactual be? I don't know. But I certainly see a lot of engagement with what I put on SciArchive, um, that a lot of people are downloading it, whatever that means, you know, are they reading it? I don't know. Um, but certainly it makes it widely accessible, right, if you put that version on there. And so I think that's something when we talk about open access, everybody can do that. It's really easy to do. It's permissible in almost all situations. Um, and it's a really nice way to make work accessible, especially to those who don't have the privileged library like I do at the University of Minnesota. I mean, I, I also want to, I, I wanted to just jump in, maybe just underline two points you made, Moin. Um and I, so one is that I agree with you that, that it's really important to work to change the system. And I really admire the work that you're doing, in part because, you know, thinking back on my earlier response of, oh, you know, for my personal research, I think of these journals, right? Part of that is because it's implicit pressure pressure that if you are a personal psychologist, this is where you need to see, be seen to be published, right? Now, there are open access journals in personality that have come up, right? So there's personality science, which is uh, John Ruthman's journal that he started a few years ago, completely open access and free, right? So they, they don't charge any fees and you could publish uh, open access. And, you know, just thinking back on some, on some of my past choices, right? I could imagine myself choosing one of the more prestigious journals as opposed to a journal like personality science, in part because it's this sort of sense that, well, for me to be seen as a personality psychologist, as a successful personality psychologist, this is what I need to do, right? Um, and I, I guess one of the, you know, this leads to a, a, a challenge in terms of telling what advice to give to early career researchers, right? Well, I think it's simultaneously true that we need to move away from this idea of prestige journals because it's not obvious that there's anything objective about them, you know, the quality associated with uh, being published in a prestige journal. Um, and at the same time, acknowledging that as insofar as the system is still changing, we also don't want to set people up to fail, right? If we tell them, well, this is where you need, like, you have the choice to publish wherever you want, if more senior figures or other people in the field are still, still using these benchmarks, right? Um, and, you know, and it just might be this necessary period we pass through. Um, but I think that's one of the challenges that we face, right? When we're simultaneously trying to make the system more equitable. And we're also advising early career researchers as to, you know, how does one succeed in, in a field like ours? 
Yeah, and that's part of the discussion that I have with students or other collaborators mm -hmm. is, you know, there's still, there are a lot of more traditionally minded folks who are really gonna value these particular outlets that are traditional outlets, but there's an emerging group and it's getting larger by the day of people mm -hmm. who really appreciate you going the public or the yeah, open access yeah. route. And really, really, um, if they see that the work is quality in that outlet, they'll really value that and value that decision. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, what are the career goals of the particular individual that I'm working with, you mm -hmm. know, and what do they want and why are they trying to publish this work? And I mean, that's, it gets back to, yeah, the motivation for it, I think is really important. Yeah. Yeah. So you raised the question of, of, um, suggestions for early career researchers. I think that would be, um, for, especially for low middle income countries, I think that would be a nice thing for us to explore a little bit more. So suggestions for how to publish their work. I mean, we know there's plenty, we know just intuitively, experientially, but there's plenty of data that there are pretty substantial biases, especially again, um, towards the global South, against the global South, to be able to publish in mainstream English language, primarily North American journals. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we deal with that? What do we do? Who's got the solution? Not the solution, but the frustration. Just very recently, we submitted our work to a different journal, more in the tech side of things. It's a newer field for me. And we got the we got a test project saying that our topic was too narrow for their broad audience. And given the similarity of the approaches we had taken, the types of analysis we had done, the narrowness, they didn't say it explicitly, but it related to our sample mm -hmm. of Peruvian adolescents. So still trying to contend uh, on what that means, how to work with that. Uh, even though I'm, and, and I have the privilege or a lower barrier of access in that I am publishing, I am I'm attempting to publish from a US institution, right? Um, we are going somewhere else. I thought of appealing that decision. I decided to go somewhere else, um, but it is, a, it is a barrier, it's clearly there. I've heard it from so many other colleagues who work internationally. It's not perceived as relevant for other countries, which shouldn't be the case. We need to justify why our sample is important, whereas people who work in the US don't necessarily need to do that. We need to characterize our sample much more, like our context. Yeah, I think those are the, the burdens and, and the frustrations that we are facing. Just to follow up on what you said, Lucia, like I do think, especially with some of the more mainstream journals, in psychology, um, there is a barrier to publishing with what we would call research that's seen as, oh, you know, it's from this particular community, therefore it isn't generalized because only American college students generalize to the global population. But, um, but and it's interesting, but I had a very similar experience with a paper that uh, looked at Sri Lankan Tamil war survivors, right? And it was just rejected from a general journal. Um, as if, I mean, because it, it, it was too sort of, niche according oh. to the editor but also what was interesting is that three years earlier we had a paper that addressed the same question using the same analysis with a sample of um trauma survivors from winston in north carolina and that was accepted the same job right so it's it, it's interesting for two reasons right um so i share your frustration i think when we when thinking about the experience of people in the global south who are, who are trying to publish their research. Um, you know, I've collaborated with colleagues in, in uh, Sri Lanka, University of Peradenia, University of Colombo. And, you know, I think that they have to deal with multiple structural challenges, right, yes. in order to do research. These universities are funded to, uh, as teaching universities. Yes. There's little time, very little resources given to people who do research. Uh, there's very little training. The people who do research, they are really motivated to do it. They typically go out for their PhDs and they get tra whatever training they get as part of their PhD, they bring back and then they try to uh, mm -hmm. what are called, you know, create a research program. In the absence of working with collaborators, they don't have the opportunity to continue to grow and learn, uh, which is like a really important part of being a researcher. Um, and so I do think that, you know, in many cases, they don't have um, good information of which, about which journals to publish in. They don't have a good sense of how to distinguish between predatory and non-predatory journals. Um, they are like they are institutions don't typically provide good incentives um, because it's very if you do it it's because you are highly motivated to do it yourself. 
Um, so I think there are a lot of structural issues that, you know, many researchers who somehow do go on to publish, right? They do work hard, they do get their papers out. There are these multiple barriers that they have to overcome in order to get their research out. Um, and, you know, with the acknowledgement, right, there's, there's no easy answer, right? One thing that we can do as collaborators, right, is to find very specific, precise ways in which we can help them um, with this process, right? Either by doing sort of informal discussions, uh, telling them about here the journals people typically publish in. I mean, similar to the discussions Moin has with his collaborators and students, right? Here are the pros and cons of different journals. Um, you know, here's why you should publish in this journal depending on your goal. So I want, you know, one action item that, you know, those of us who are lucky to work at US uni universities can do is to be that mentor, right? To our, our collaborators in those universities. Um, but, you know, it is true that they face considerable uh, structural bar barriers as in, in terms of gaining out their research. So picking up on something you said, Aranda, um, from the editorial side, um, you know, I, I both journals I worked at, um, I desk reject a very large number of submissions. So by desk reject, just to be clear, and everyone knows terminology, right? That's if a paper is submitted to the journal, first I review every paper that gets submitted, and then I decide whether or not to send it, assign it to an associate editor who will send it out for peer review, or just to reject it straight away without sending it out for peer review. And this is what like Lucia was saying and Arenda that, um, and we, again, we know there's data about this that, um, um, authors from the global south are much more likely to have this kind of um, decision from North American based journals or European based journals, um, largely because of it being perceived as too narrow and not generalizable, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I've, you know, I've just rejected a large number of papers from authors from the global south. And I'd say the number one reason why that is, is related to what Aranda was just saying, is that the, the submission is not a good fit for the journal in terms of the topic. Mm -hmm. It's not the right journal. You know, I am very open and encouraging of work from underrepresented countries, looking at underrepresented communities, using underrepresented methods. You know, I'm trying to promote that as much as possible. But you know, sometimes I'll get, uh, I'll often get articles that are, you know, infant and child development, for example, a lot of medically focused um, kinds of art papers or that are focused really on physical health. Um, whereas we very have very explicit guidelines that were focused on psychological processes uh, that underlie development. So we just don't publish that kind of work. And I think it's, um, you know, I, I don't know what the major barrier is there, um, but I think that happens quite a lot to get articles that just that just don't don't have a chance. Um, it would get desk rejected if it was coming from, you know, authors in the U.S. also because it's just totally out of scope. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not related to what we publish. And related to that, oftentimes a lot of the formatting is just look is very different than what we typically typically would see for an APA style or similar kind of paper. And so I guess that I think one thing that seems really important is for authors to be sure you always read the author guidelines mm -hmm. on the journal, on the journal web page. Now sometimes it can be out of date, but it's good to see what is what do they publish in this journal? What has been published recently in this journal? What are the expectations for how this is going to be prepared? You know, again, it, those the, 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 the deck is already stacked against you as authors. And so you want to really make sure that you're informed and you know that you're submitting it to a place that where it has a decent chance. Um, and so I think that's really important. The other thing that I advocate for, and some a lot of other editors would totally disagree with me about this, but something that I say people should do is that if you're not sure whether or not it should, it fits with the journal, email the editor directly. Send an email, say potential potential submission for your journal, give a very brief description of the article, maybe paste the abstract at the end, maybe attach the paper if you want to, and say, is this generally in line with what you would consider? Mm -hmm. And personally, I much prefer getting that because it's a lot, it saves me time and it saves the author's time to not have to go through the whole system and all the bureaucracy of uploading a manuscript and checking it in and all that kind of stuff to me to be look at it and sometimes take 30 seconds and say either yes absolutely please submit i can't guarantee it's gonna get published or anything but please submit it um or no this is out of scope submit it to a journal that focuses on parenting that focuses on physical health that focuses on whatever right and so the worst case scenario is if you do that is an editor will not respond 
I think, and then you're exactly where you were before, and you can just go ahead and submit it. But um, I, I really, you know, it increases a lot of email and there's more communication, but I prefer that because I think in the end, it saves a lot of time and heartache. A quick follow-up. I've always been curious. From an editor's perspective, does a cover letter matter much? Not really. Should we be spending time writing that or not? Ah, yes. The cover letter question. Um, the answer to that is it depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no good answer to that. It really depends primarily by discipline. Um, in most psychology, for most psychology journals, developmental journals, human development, whatever, family studies, all those journals, cover letter is essentially meaningless for an initial submission. It's kind of like, here's the paper, APA ethical guidelines were followed, it's not submitted anywhere else, I'm the contact person, right? Here, in other words, here it is, have fun. But certainly in other disciplines, they expect like a sales pitch um where you have a long and maybe some of the vanity journals actually expect that too so if you're going to submit to nature or science or whatever pns they're going to expect more of a sell in terms of why they should care and maybe some editors like it too so this goes back to my previous comment look and see what it says on the website what the cover letter should say but usually in most psychology journals it doesn't matter at all but it depends Uh, yeah, so just to follow up on what Moin said, it, it does depend. And I will say as an associate editor, I will skim the cover letter to make sure there's like, you know, that relevant information is there, you know, ethical guidelines are followed, that, you know, if the data has been published, published in other articles, it's a list of the publications, right? So you just check those. Um, but, you know, I can tell you one example of, of a recent paper I reviewed where the reviewers went to, like, they had different opinions about the journal, about the paper. I read the paper, then I read the reviews. And when I was reading the paper, I read the cover letter. And in the cover letter, there was a pitch as to why the article was a good fit for the journal, right? And maybe I would have come to the decision myself, but after, as I was reading that, I was so sort of swayed by the fact that, okay, you know, this paper has like um, some, some challenges, but it is a good fit for this journal, right? So, it, you know, I don't think you should spend a long time writing paragraphs and paragraphs. I think just one, you know, one page that has all the relevant information. But I do think, especially if you have a good sense that your article is a good fit for the journal, saying that explicitly in the cover letter, even in one sentence or two, won't do you any harm. Um, so if, you know, I, I do think Moin's advice is fantastic. And I would suggest as a, you know, an additional step, you, you confirm that the journal is a good fit for your article and you say why in your cover letter in one or two sentences. Thank you, and I'm realizing now might be useful to run uh, participants through the process. Maybe not everyone's aware of like the multiple steps. You now mentioned as, as you're an associate editor. How is that different from an editor? Maybe I don't know if that's worth just talking about. Uh, okay, I'll say some broad outlines mm -hmm. and then anyone can chip in. So again, it depends. Journals operate in different ways and they sometimes use different language for these different roles. But generally, most journals in psychology will have kind of a three primary roles um, for a journal. So they'll be the editor in chief. Sometimes there's multiple, but usually just one editor in chief. That's the main person who's in charge. That's the person who does the initial check-in of the articles. Um, as I said, they're the ones who usually are desk rejecting articles. Again, at bigger journals, you might have multiple people doing this, but generally speaking, that's what the editor in chief does. The editor in chief also sets journal policy um, within whatever constraints they might have. So if it's a, a or if it's a journal that's sponsored by a scientific society, that society usually has some say in how the journal operates. The publisher has some say, et cetera. But the, the editor has a lot of control there. And then there's usually a team of associate editors. Sometimes they're also referred to as action editors or handling editors. Um, those all pretty much mean the same thing. Those are the people who are actually going to be the ones who decide on your paper, who send it out for, if, if it passes the desk reject phase. So if the, if the editor-in-chief assigns it to one of these people, they then send it out to reviewers, um, usually anywhere between two and four typically, but it could be one and seven, you never know. Um, so the associate editor is the one who really handles that whole process. They solicit, they secure the reviewers, they read over the reviews, and then they um, 
write the decision letter. It's important to know that the editor editor in chief always is the final one who approves that decision letter. So I see every decision letter. So anything that the associate editors are doing, I know what they're doing, which is good to know that the editor in chief is kind of aware or should be aware. It's possible they don't always look at it. They might just approve it without looking, but usually the editor has to do it. So you have editor in chief, associate editors, again, which sometimes are action editors or handling editors. And then you have the editorial board, sometimes called like the consulting board. Um, what else is that called? I think that's pretty much an editor or consulting board. Um, and those are people who they don't handle articles, but they basically have volunteered their time to review for the journal at an above average rate. So some journals require maybe six reviews a year, some say 10 reviews, some say six reviews and you don't get any <laughs> invitations all year. So it could be none. Um, but it means you're kind of agreeing to um, to receive more submissions that you're, you're, you'll likely agree to review papers. So that's what the editorial board is. And before I stop speaking on this, I'll say that that is one thing where um, earlier career researchers have an opportunity to really get involved. Um, if you have reviewed for a journal of, you know, two or three times and seem to have done a good job, you can always email the editor in chief and say, hey, I've done some reviews for your journal. I would like to be added to the editorial board. Would you consider adding me to the editorial board? Um, and so I get, I get emails like that from people and I'm usually thrilled to have somebody who wants to be on the board, who wants to do more reviews, right? Um, but even if you haven't um, done reviews for a particular journal, but you want to get involved, you can always email the editor and say, hey, I'd like to get involved doing some reviewing, hopefully get on the board at some point. And again, they'd be happy to help you out usually and get you signed up into the journal. What am I forgetting? Um, I guess I'll mention a couple of things. I mean, you, come, you did a great job coming at mine. Um, so I'm an associate editor. Um, and so I get the manuscripts after the editor has done his initial sort of review and desk rejects. Now, I do like I do start by reading through the papers, um, and I have you know if in my view I feel that the the, the paper won't do well or is likely be rejected after peer review, I I I'll make a recommendation and desk reject it. So and typically the editor will go along with that. So there is this this might be true, not true at all journals, but at least for the two journals I'm I'm an associate editor for, they I have that opportunity to desk reject if I think um, the paper will likely not do not do well in peer review. Uh, and then once I get the reviews back, I make a decision. Um, and I think one thing that's worth um, keeping in mind is the, the associate editor makes a recommendation to the editor based on his consideration or her consideration of the manuscript and the reviews. And it's not a simple case of, well, if the reviews are mostly positive or the reviews are positive, two positive, one negative, that means the, the article is going to be rejected or accepted. Um, and, you know, and I, you know, in my experience, I have received rejections where I've looked at reviews and thought, well, these, this wasn't bad, right? I, these weren't so bad. I could, I could have responded to them. But what the editor does is the editor takes the reviewer's comments into, into consideration as she or he makes their final decision. Um, and there are usually other, you know, so it's important to think when you look, when you get a decision on, on a letter, it's worth keeping in mind that it's not simply being counted, right? It's not simply, you know, oh, this, this article got two positive reviews, therefore revise and resubmit or accept, or this, two, these, uh, this manuscript got two negative reviews uh, and therefore reject. You know, I have, there are manuscripts where I have gotten two reviews that were either lukewarm or negative. I've read the comments and thought, well, I'm not sure, you know, maybe the reviewers don't have the expertise or the reviews were short, so in those cases, you you try and find another reviewer, right? You try and find, find additional uh, what are called referees to look at the paper. Um, there have been cases where when reviews are split, you make a decision, right? And when you make a decision, you're gonna make one of the reviewers angry, right? Or two of the three reviewers angry. Uh, but that's the responsibility that comes with being an associate editor and an editor. Um, so I just want to like highlight that fact because you know I think it's reasonable. When you get reviews back on a paper, you might read through the reviews and think, well, why did I get the, de de the decision that I got? Um, and I will note, in some cases, you sh if you think the decision was unreasonable, you are totally within your rights to appeal. That is totally fine. 
Uh, there are cases where decisions have been overturned. Um, when I speak to other associate editors and editor, we are encouraged to acknowledge the fact that we might be wrong when there appeals, because if you make a mistake, we should own up to it. Um, it turns out that people from certain demographics are more likely to appeal the decision. So I really encourage all of you, you think you have a strong case, you know, it's not, it, in, you shouldn't worry about people thinking in pain of you, appeal. Uh, because worst case scenario, you get a negative decision. Yeah, and people definitely appeal. Um for this for the reasons that Arendo was just bringing up about the inequalities of who's appealing. Um, I've set a policy at my journals that um, other journals have now adopted as well about what the criteria for appeals are. And so there's only two reasons why I'll ever entertain an appeal. One is if there a factual error was made, if somewhere so if the reviewers made a factual error and the associate editor was relying on that factual editor er, error in their decision, um, or if they can play um, provide clearly substantiated um, instances of bias or unfair treatment. So if there's some way to be able to really demonstrate that they were treated unfairly in the process. Um, what I don't allow is people say, oh, but I can respond to these comments, <laughs> right? Because yeah, yeah. everybody right. thinks they can respond to the comments, mm -hmm. right? That's where it becomes more about argumentativeness and persistence yeah. and things like that. And that's not what I'm looking to reward. Mm -hmm. um, but most journals don't have policies like that. And you can, it never hurts to, to appeal if you really feel like you have a good case. Um, okay, I think maybe we should move on to another uh, topic as I'm looking at the time. Um, when I'm particularly interested in the ideas that you all have, which is what would you like to see to increase representation in publishing? So what what, would, what are some policies or practices or procedures? You know, what could we do to change things? Um, Lucia, you've given a couple stories about, you know, bad experiences you've had, you know, do you, do you think there are ways to prevent those experiences and make publishing a more equitable process? Um, certainly, I think, especially when, when working with populations from outside the US, it helps for journals like the one I mentioned where it asks for everyone to sort of declare where is the population you're working with, to, to have like the same standards for everyone. So everyone should say that country they're working with, uh, give some context, maybe you want to justify why that population, uh, I would like to see that happening. I, I have come across some other papers, perhaps outside psychology, that at least include abstracts in other languages. I know, um, yeah, English is a language in which we mostly do science, for better or for worse, uh, or lingua franca, but challenging that idea as well. Um, I know sometimes journals, and I don't know financially how this would work, but sometimes the onus of getting an editor in English or, or, or translation services is put on the author. I think that that's perhaps unfair, but I don't know where we could find resources for for this help with editing manuscripts in English. Um, yes, and, and I, I now know like many journals have these credit uh, mm -hmm. statements where people are very explicitly saying what they did uh, in the manuscript, whether they wrote the manuscript, analyzed data, got funding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think those statements could be broadened to include more issues of diversity and inclusion um, certainly team science approaches uh, are sort of uh, one solution to these things where we who have perhaps a bit more resources in certain universities can sort of support other colleagues. Um, yes, but these are very loose ideas. Uh, so happy to hear your thoughts. So I have a couple of thoughts, and this builds on some of the things that uh, Lucia and Noin were both said, right? So, to the, you know, there's simple things we could do to facilitate people in the from the global south um, learning more about which journals are appropriate, which journals they should submit the manuscripts to. Uh, you know, one easy uh, option would be to record a series of webinars where we really clearly explain this: what this journal is, this is what we do. Here's how you should prepare your uh, how you should think about which journal is a good fit for you. Here's how you should prepare your 
uh, manuscript for publication. Here's some resources, right? So, you know, um, information about like how to cite paper. You know, you know, the, the, there might be very simple resources that we could record that could be um, accessible, right, to people in these countries who want to publish, but they, because they've had limited experience, they don't know which journal to submit to, and they don't know how to format their manuscripts so that what I'll call uh, they're a good fit for the journal. Um, and that's something that's something we could do. Um, another thought would be to the extent to which different journals have been open to publishing uh, research from different countries. Um, it might be that the editors or the associate editors or volunteers from the editorial board could volunteer to contact different universities, offer to do informal uh, discussions and saying, hey, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, about, pub about publishing, here's what you need to know, here's what we do with this journal, but just more generally, right? If you're interested in doing research, if you want to know, well, are, is my research enough? Or are these two studies enough, right? I could be, I could act as a mentor, right? Um, so there might, be, there might be this possibility to do these sort of informal sessions where we do not just talk about here's how you publish in this journal, but talk about, you know, here's how you go about creating a manuscript that might be compared, right, at, at a particular journal. Um, so, you know, th that's the second idea. I mean, that would require reasons, maybe not that many resources, but at least time on our parts, right? Um, but that would be another idea that we could consider. So, uh, go ahead, Lucy. Sorry, and perhaps I could speak to, to my recent very positive experience. I am part of the Society for Research in Adolescence, the there's a COVID-19 task force. And as part of that, there was, I think one of the few silver linings of COVID is that it has sort of brought everyone together in terms of research interests or and types of papers we're writing. And the comparison across countries is perhaps easier to do. So as part of this task force, uh, Dr. Andrea Husong, who is leading the task force, mm -hmm. she actually did um, sort of in partnership with JRA, which is a journal of the society and with the conference um, uh, mentor matching. So mentors from, uh, who have a lot of experience publishing with mentees from the global south, most of them. And it's going to be a two year long process. She's wonderful. She managed to get resources to support this work. So I, for example, currently I'm mentoring uh, researchers in Uruguay and another researcher who's working with Bolivia uh, from the US. And that sort of continued like meetings we need like every month. Like, yeah, that's that's a formalized way of doing that because we have the society, we have the journal and yeah, she we, we managed to get resources. So that's been a, a wonderful experience and hopefully there's a way for something similar. I'm glad you brought that up because I saw her give a talk about that program in July. And it, yeah, it, it's fantastic. That's great. Um, I have sort of a different angle. You know, usually I'm, I'm often thinking at the level of journal policy and journal operations, just because that's where my head is most of the time in terms of how to reform things, especially because we do have very much, a, I think, a top-down kind of environment where a lot of what we do and the way we publish is because that's what journals either require us to do or allow us to do, right? Mm -hmm. So if journals change, we change. Um, and so, you know, we've known that journal editors and editorial boards have not be su been sufficiently diverse, um, even when you look just within the U.S., right? It's not sufficiently diverse, but especially if you start looking globally. Um, and so it requires, um, you know, we need to diversify who's actually setting policy and making decisions. Um, but that can be challenging because how do you get those positions if you can't get in those positions, right? It becomes kind of a circular problem. But one really great way to get in to the, into the sort of journal leadership a little bit or get some experience editing is to do a special issue of a journal. Special issues are almost always driven by an organized and uh, motivated group of potential editors who want to do the special issue. So I get approached by a group of people who say, I want to do a special issue on this topic. I say, okay, great. Here's what I want. I want a proposal. It needs to include these things. You know, it has information about what the topic's going to be, who the editors are, um, where the papers are going to come from. You know, is it an open call? Is there going to be some invited papers, whatever, what the timeline is? And then I work with them to develop the idea to see if it's a good fit um, for the journal. 
And that is a wonderful way for, um, for those from the Global South and early career researchers to get involved in editing without having a huge commitment. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities for that. So if you're interested in doing some kind of special issue, I highly recommend reaching out to the editor of a journal and just asking, is it, do you accept some proposals for special issues? If so, what is involved? Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes it seems editors are a little bit more willing to kind of maybe do a special issue on something they see is a little outside the norm because that's it's a special issue. It's not yeah. something that's part of their regular flow at that point is they're trying something new and that's kind of what the point is. And if it goes well, and it pretty much always does go well, um, that opens up doors for more opportunities. You can get on the board, you could potentially become an associate editor yourself. And then one day you become an editor in chief. As I said, editors have a tremendous amount of power. If you really wanna change the system and increase representation, you need to seize that power right one way or another um and you do it by doing a lot of reviews becoming an editor and and doing it i mean that's as a graduate student who was learning about you know focused on race ethnicity and culture and development um and really sort of upset with all the stories that have already been told and that everybody knows about work being rejected from top tier journals or any journals because it's focusing on cultural issues i realized the only way this is going to change is if i if me and others who are committed to these ideas take um, positions of power and change the policies. And so what I decided to do is I accepted every single review invitation I ever got. I accepted every invitation to a, be on an editorial board. I accepted and I sort of, and then I had enough sort of, I did special issues and I had kind of a resume that I could get an associate editor position, then an editor position. And then, you know, and I've been able to change policies at multiple journals and then use that experience to advocate at other journals as well. Um, and so it is not to sound too trite, but one person can do a pretty good amount um, if you really want to do it. But it requires getting your foot in the door, right, and getting that experience, which is especially challenging for those from the global south. But I do think special issues um, are the way to go. I'll just add one one thought to that. I, th I completely agree with you. And uh, and um, many journals are very open to special issues. Uh, you know, for those of you who are interested in special issues and might want to work with collaborators who might have more experience, you know, you and one option is that if you if you are interested in a particular topic, you could write to someone. You could connect with someone and say, you know, I'm interested in your work. I'm interested in doing the special issue. Is this something you want to work on together? If you have existing collaborators who work at North American or European universities, you could talk to them about, oh, you're down the line, maybe this is something you could do together. Um, so, you know, if you are wondering whether this is something you could do by yourself, if you have concerns about approaching uh, a journal by yourself, that is one other route, right? To just reach out and uh, solicit collaborators. Absolutely. Um, I think we've been going for close to an hour or so. So I think we can, if anyone has any final words of wisdom, maybe that they want to share or thoughts that have been sitting in their mind that they just need to let free. Well, I'll just say, you know, for those of you who've uh, been kind enough to listen to us over, over the last hour, it might be that we'll answer some, of your, some or many of your questions. It might be that our discussion has brought even more questions to mind. And I just want to say that please feel free to contact me if you have any questions, no matter how simple. Uh, I'm very happy to answer questions the best that I can. or refer you to people who might know the better, a better answer than me. So if, you, if, uh, if a question that you had regarding uh, disseminating research or peer review wasn't answered, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'll echo Aranda's very generous thoughts. I will say personally, as an early career uh, researcher, being on Twitter has really allowed me to sort of participate on conversations that I wouldn't have had access to, and that's mm -hmm. open to everyone. So that's one recommendation I give my students. Open a Twitter account, start following people who might be in this conversation or are relevant to topics you're interested in, um, and you sort of get a feel for these discussions that often we don't. Uh, I'm not an editor, but now um, I've heard these discussions. I can sort of follow them on Twitter sometimes. So that would be one of my recommendations. And similarly, I'm, I'm happy to help you with, with any questions that we might not have answered. 
Yeah, that, that's a great point. You know, there are a lot of editors on Twitter who are often talking about editorial stuff. And mm -hmm. so if you're following those people, you can get insights into what's going on sometimes. That's really helpful. And yes, absolutely. Feel free to contact uh, me with any questions or comments or thoughts. Otherwise, um, I think we're doing a live Q&A. <laughs> I should know that. Okay, mm -hmm. yes. We will see you shortly at the live Q&A. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.